Our next panel member, Jennifer Bonin, is the founder and she's the CEO of one of the larger and growing, fast growing of the high tech startups in our region, a uh, big data firm that has been focusing on providing solutions. And in this case, parents becoming very aware of all the different challenges and their students, their learners having those challenges coming home. Uh, Jennifer and her company began talking with the administrators, with the students, with teachers, with other parents about what could be done to provide some technological solutions, to provide some opportunities to eliminate part of the big divide between the digital and the physical. And this uh, next tape is a part of the conversation with the administrator and senior uh, designers and administrative staff for the largest school district in our state in Okahannepin, 40,000 students. And we'll get a glimpse of what they are thinking about, what they need. And then we'll come back to Jennifer and talk about what solutions they created. Well, welcome everyone to International Day of Education. My name is Jen Bonin. I'm the CEO of a Minnesota tech startup focused in the AI space and in assisting using technology in spaces where we can help youth as well as others in our communities. I'm excited to be joined today for International Day of Education by several of the leaders and administrators who are leading one of the largest school districts in the state of Minnesota. So please welcome um, David Law, who is the superintendent for Anoka Hennepin Schools. We have Dr. Joel Verdine, who is the chief technology officer. We have Dr. Mary Wolverton, who is the associate superintendent of elementary schools for Anoka Hennepin. And we have Jessica Lipa, who is the director of career and tech education for Anoka Hennepin. Thank you all of you for joining us here today. You all have big jobs um, with what's been going on in the world, I'm sure as all of you have had to adjust. So first I'd like to start with, you know, as leaders and administrators, as we mentioned in one of the largest school districts for the state of Minnesota, could you maybe explore with us to start some of the big challenges looking back now over this past year that you guys have been enduring and dealing with, with parents and families, students, and your district? Jennifer, I'll, I'll take this one. Thank you. That's a great question. Uh, kind of a funny story. Last February, we surveyed our staff and said, how many of you are, are ready for our students to be one-to-one -one with technology? And about less than half of them said, we're ready. And three weeks later, the pandemic hit schools full swing. And we told our staff, guess what? All of we, us are gonna move in this direction quickly. So getting our staff and our students, those tools in a matter of a week or two was one of our biggest challenges. And then building staff confidence with competency in digital instruction. And you know the courage to fail in a new environment. And for some of them in an environment, they've been so confident and successful. Um, ramping up their ability to teach, changing mindsets about what education looks like for our teachers and really for our parents, because our parents had this sort of odd dichotomy of, I want my student to be on a screen seven hours a day with the teacher, but please don't have them on a screen seven hours a day, right? And how, how we can shift that mindset. And, and finally, gaps. Gaps with students' access to Technology, and while we can provide it, you know, bandwidth in their house, bandwidth across our community, content support, you know, five to 10 year olds, and even some 17 and 18 year olds, they're not great independent focused learners, and having parents support those students, all of that, that's sort of been the ongoing challenge over the last year. Wow, I mean, that's just massive. And just to give people an idea for the volume and number of students we're talking about for your district, would it be okay to share some of those numbers just so they understand this is not a small population you guys are leading through sure. this? We're, we're just Northwest of Minneapolis. We cover 13 communities. We have just under 40,000 students and we deployed well over 20,000 uh, pieces of technology in about five days uh, across mm -hmm. 40 school sites. 
That's amazing statistics. And I think important for people to know, right, what um, was done and the efforts that a district like Anoka Hennepin made to make this possible. Now, the next question I would ask in light of what you just shared with us is some of these challenges. As we're reaching across to global leaders, we've obviously got um, some new folks leading um, the United States now that have taken office as well. What is needed to help our schools from your perspective to be successful given the current state of the world? Well, I, I know you've given me about two minutes and you've asked a three-day answer. <laughs> um, and I'll share some of this with my colleagues later, but you know, we are the center of our community in terms of equalizing opportunity. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we take on the role of preparing students for whatever dream they have personally. And there's a lot of complexity in that. There, there's public expectations for what our students should be prepared for. And then there's personal aspirations of students and those aren't always aligned. Um, on top of that, our, many of our adults were educated in a time that doesn't work for the future of our workforce. And so we need to shift public and community mindsets about what do our students need coming out of our system? And many times it's not our educators or our students that are the challenge, it's elected officials and parents who are saying, I want those students to learn things that are, were, were important to me. And so we're, we're really looking for a mindset shift our, our employers tell us they need creative, hardworking, positive students who can work in well, well collaboratively. And our elected officials say, I want someone to know statistics and pre-calc by their junior year. And I want everyone on a college ready track. And so we're trying to blend in some of those soft skills that so many employers want and that project focus uh, of helping kids work together on projects which so many employers need. That, that's probably our biggest challenge. You know, Funding will help. Mindset shift is first. Yeah, no, and it takes a lot to, you know, do what you guys did in terms of funding, in terms of support, you know, all of the things you mentioned, and then that mindset shift, right? So I would say for all the parents, um, politicians, <laughs> folks watching this, you know, we need to help the, our administrators, our leaders, and our school districts with these challenges and be ready to have those tough conversations about bridging those gaps of where the students may be and where folks who were educated years ago maybe versus where we are today. So I think those are great um, challenges to put out there for folks to help and assist with. We're hearing um, from students and parents their challenges. Obviously, you guys probably hear from them on a regular basis, um, fielding their calls. Um, but we understand that right now um, for students and parents, as administrators, there's things that keep you guys up at night in the 25 plus schools that you're dealing with. So as you look to, not in retrospective the last year, but looking forward to our future, what are those things right now that are playing out for all of you, just so our parents, students, and everyone else needing to support you, our politicians know those challenges that still keep you up at night about moving those students into the next six months, the next 12 months that you need? Well, thank you, Jen. That's an excellent question. Um, as Superintendent Law previously noted, particularly during this time of, of pandemic, um, educational systems have had to do a, um, a very rapid system shift in how we focus on our instructional practices and really how we take a step back and just look at our educational institutions. Prior to the pandemic, um, I would um, note that Dr. Joel Verdine um, was starting a really great body of work and continues that work as we look at a portrait of a graduate and look at some of the variables that Superintendent Law just mentioned on how do we prepare our students to be um, successful um, post high school and college and career ready. And I would say what keeps administrators up at night are a lot of different things, but I would say probably one of the um, consistent concerns I hear from either administrators, teachers, or parents is how do we support all of them with this shift to more virtual learning and how we're shifting our instructional practices with one of the biggest concerns being 
we want to be mindful that we're not increasing the opportunity gap for our learners, we're decreasing that opportunity gap. Oh, that's a that's a great point with where you guys are facing those challenges because I think a lot of times, you know, um, it takes a lot to move things forward from a district perspective, and all of you as leaders and the administrators are trying to move that forward, but need the collaboration cooperation of a lot of other folks to make that happen and allow them to see how you're trying to assist them in that practice. So thank you um, for that advice and insight to us. I think it's important we hear about that. And um, Dr. Joel Verdine, uh, interestingly enough, a CTO, is this a common practice? I know I'm springing new questions on you, but do most districts have a chief technology officer in their district who is helping, assisting, and aiding Superintendent Law and Associate Superintendent Dr. Mary Wilberton in rolling out these practices to your constituents, students, parents, and families? Um, it's interesting, the landscape of people that do this um, particular job does vary a great deal. Um, because there it generally hasn't been a specific roadmap for this position. When we think of principles, the preparation process for principles, the certification, all leads to having people with similar experience and um, qualifications. But in my job, um, we come from a lot of different backgrounds. And so I wouldn't say that this is um, common, but what I would say for, for all people who hold this position, this is where we need to be working because our role um, in educational technology is actually to support the end the end product of the organization. And I think that's true of private industry and in, in, in any organization. Technology is there to serve um, the goals and missions of the organization. And so, um, you know, certainly being, um, I actually have the privilege of, of working very closely with, um, with leadership and, and be able to um, bring a voice and be able to help them along and us along with what our goals are. I love that. I just think it's so wonderful to see and I hope that um, more school districts will be having organizations where they include someone um, of your position helping and assisting. Because to your point, I mean, where technology meets those constituents and these students, um, it's incredibly critical, it appears at this time, more than even ever. It always was important, but now having that foresight. So I applaud Anoka Hennepin for having such foresight to put folks into those roles to support. And as you, we all heard, one of the critical things was the deployment of a lot of technology in a very short period of time. And not only deployment, but I'm assuming safety and security is of utmost importance as well, because you're dealing with access to children and students and minors under the age of 18 as well. Yes. Uh, so safety and security, um, obviously one of the, the large components supporting um, home environments. My team was really, really good at supporting our 40 to 50 schools, uh, but now we're supporting 38,000 homes uh, in terms of their connectivity um, and professional development. Um, we uh, realize now we have new partners at home that we need to engage with in order for them to help their students where our teachers can't physically be with them. Absolutely. So I applaud you guys in that um, regard and what you've been able to do through this current situation. So thank you. Um, I appreciate that. Now switching gears a little bit. I know this is a short interview with all of you, but want to switch gears a little bit to um, some of what we're hearing around the lasting impact of mental health issues that students um, seem to be dealing with right now, not only with our younger kids around their development, but also with children becoming um, depressed, withdrawn, um, even we've heard in some of the districts, higher situations of um, children taking their own lives and the suicide rates increasing in some of these districts where the students now don't have that outlet of their teachers support structures systems in the schools. Um, any thoughts on that and how um, or what you guys are hearing in terms or feeling in terms of that impact already? That's an excellent question, Jen. Um, currently in our school district, as well as many other school districts, we have a system of support for students' mental health needs, and it varies by level um, in relation to what those systems look like. Um, those systems are inclusive of school counselors, school social workers, student achievement advisors, mental, licensed mental health therapists, and nurses. Schools have um, increased their awareness 
as well as their access to these resources for our students and our families, particularly at this time when more students are virtual learning. Um, that has been inclusive of websites, parent forums, advisory lessons, and email co um, correspondence with links as well. Parallel to that, our district pre-pandemic and currently during the pandemic has um, an intentional focus on collaborating with both Hennepin County agencies and Anoka County agencies and providing additional resources for our families. That's amazing and so needed, it sounds like, for our families and students. So I applaud the district for taking those additional steps to help support students and families through this time. And as Joel mentioned, we're now supporting not only them in their school environment, but now all of them in that home environment as they learn from a different space physically than where they used to be. So I think, I think even with that, I, um, David, I um, believe you have something else to add to that as well. Yeah, I, I would just add what, you know, I think where we have the drop off is we have multiple counselors supported our secondary sites or we have social workers and we have a full time mental health provider at all of our sites that drops off considerably when kids are the school day ends and from 3.30 or 4 at night until 8 the next day, the ease and contacting someone who can provide assistance for parents or students is gone. Yeah. And, and we, we aren't ever staffed to be a 24 hour a day mental health crisis response, but increasingly our parents are realizing we're much easier to get a hold of a, a person we have a relationship than come the county support. So we're really, the future of this is how to get a county support network that is consistent and as reliable as our school support is during the school day. Well, and that's good to note as well, right, for those asks of things that are needed to really support the new structure we're all operating in in the world. Now, I would also ask you, you know, obviously, we've talked about mental health, we've touched on some of the challenges, we know that technology is critical, we've talked about the new journey of a student and what that looks like to prepare them to successfully enter the workforce or their next goals post you know, their education with all of you in the K-12 district. Um, how are you guys planning to adapt to meet the needs of education and integrate more technology in a seamless and effective way for that educational experience, whether that be virtual, hybrid, or in person? And if you can, I would love for you to touch on, do you guys foresee, because I hear this sometimes, but it's becoming less, that people envision um, everyone just going back, right? Everyone says, when we get back to normal and we all just are able to be in person, how do you guys actually um, perceive the next six, 12, 18 months in terms of your students? And will technology play a role in not only in-person education, but continued options around hybrid and virtual education? Um, well, I think that if I had to envision what would be next and how we take it to that next level, um, we learned a lot through our experiences in distance learning. We learned that when you give the students the tools, the resources, um, and provided an understanding of what the expectation is and what the standards are, students' creativity will skyrocket. They will produce something that is far mm -hmm. beyond even what the teacher expected and anticipated. And what we learned is that students are when they are given the opportunity to design their own learning and design their own evidence of effectiveness, we have found that they have done a tremendous job um, taking a role in their own education. I think that we also learned that if we didn't inhibit the medium or the technology, whatever they may use, and we allowed them that creativity and allowed them the opportunity to take risk, our students want to learn anytime and anywhere. This could be in the evenings, it could be in the weekends, it may, they may want the flexibility to um, learn through internships, community outreach, um, activism. Uh, it might be through cultural experiences, but if we allow them to try to meet the standards, um, I believe that we'll see learning be more relevant to students and it'll be geared towards career interests, other areas of interest, um, like I said, cultural competency. I think that we're finding that our students um, can really take it to that next level when we give them that freedom and that ability to, to learn other times than in a traditional school setting. 
No, that makes absolute sense. So what I'm hearing too is there's going to be more optionality probably around where and how students learn in the future. So outside of just what we've traditionally thought as our in-person schooling, then education that's delivered to them, which is amazing. I think that's a great plan. As a um, person who looks for some of those students eventually to hire into an organization and a company, that's um, definitely pleasantly received from someone like myself looking for students with those types of experiences. Now, I would say, you know, um, Dr. Joel Verdine mentioned it when he talked about private sector. When we think about companies, organizations, what they're looking for when students are ready to enter the workforce, their demands are high of what they want to see in those students coming out of the educational system. Um, I think from the perspective of a lot of private sector folks, they would say education historically has been known to maybe not move at the pace that the private sector is moving in terms of advancements and rapid change in what's happening. We've seen exponential changes in terms of technology in the private sector, what people are using. Are there any plans um, for the schools or the districts to ask or request, not only because it's not always just up to you, it's about funding and politics and lots of other things as well, but to help get um, support to accelerate and adapt to the pace of change that we're now seeing and that we see parents, students, and teachers wanting as well as they see the world around them shifting very quickly. Um, I, 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 it's kind of interesting you mentioned the, the rate of change for schools and um, we have a, a model that was created um, over a hundred years ago and um, many of the components of that model still remain um, with us and um, I, I do think that almost all schools that I'm aware of there are very very large conversations going on currently about um, the skills that we think our students need to be, to be successful and some of the, um, you know, much of the talk is around how do you prepare kids for a world that is that is quickly changing? How do you make sure that our students are lifelong learners? How do you make sure that our students are going to be the people who are going to be um, flexible and, and have the ability to change, responsible for their learning? Um, those things are, are very, very strong conversations going on right now. And in my corner of the world, which is the technology realm, um, I can't tell you how disruptive um, not in a bad way, but the word disruptive, just how, how much change in the outside world is actually a strong driver in terms of how we react. There are so many things that we used to do that we can't do that way anymore, um, just because of how, how quickly and, and rapid, um, how much rapid change we've seen within technology. Um, as an example, it's too difficult for us to plan and present professional development at a pace where the applications that we're adopting have grown too numerous. So we have to think about professional learning in a completely different way. How do we flip that over on its ear? Um, same with the adoption of new technologies, which um, um, uh, are a, a real conversation going on right now because of how many things that we put in place. Um, uh, the adoption process is slow and cumbersome and, and we have to find a way to flip that on its ear as well. So it sounds like all of you are ready and um, looking for how you can adapt to some of the things you are seeing. So anyways, we can all support you. We want to do that. You are the future. You hold the future with all of these young students in your hands. Um, and we applaud all of you for all of the hard work that you've put in over this last period to adapt and make those changes for our students. So I would just wrap up by saying, um, I'll open it up to any final comments for any of you, but um, to thank all of you for all of the hard work that often goes unseen behind the scenes that makes the rest of that work seamlessly for students, parents, teachers, everyone else that depend on you guys every day. So we appreciate and applaud all the efforts and any final comments from anyone, um, things we didn't touch on that you guys would like to leave us with. You know, there is a perception, Jennifer, thanks for asking for final comments, that uh, public education is virtually unchanged in the last 50 years. And one of the things that I, I would push back on is we've never offered a more broad and relevant set of content for our students. The Justice program changes annually based on career input. Where it's, a, it's a national model for how to get kids into um, coursework that's hands-on, whether it be um, 
welding or, or auto mechanics, but it, across our system, every year we're offering much more relevant coursework than even 10 years ago. And we're offering in a format that's embedding um, technology and virtual experiences like never before. And really the confines that prevent us from changing are uh, our requirements at the state level or content requirements that prevent us from giving those students rich experiences. Mm -hmm. And so it's about our society saying, are we really willing to let kids who are passionate about computer programming dive into that when they're 15 and let them uh, get a little bit less of some other content areas? And those are things that our society has to wrestle with. We're ready within public education. If we get the flexibility to think boldly, we're ready to move. We just need to have society walk with us. Thank you so much for visiting with us. We're thrilled to be part of this activity. And as you can see, I've got a very talented team to work with to move forward for our kids. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome. We are excited today to have joining us one of our frontline educators and two of our students who are real time experiencing the challenges of education during a pandemic and the current state of our world. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves. So we will start with um, Justine, one of our educators who lives on the front lines of how to get education out to students in an ever-changing environment. And then two of our students, Carter and Merle, who will give us um, their introductions, and then we'll dig into some questions. Justine, take it away. Uh, thank you for having us. Um, I, I really appreciate just having the opportunity to be able to provide some valuable feedback. Um, I, again, am Justine Wewers. Uh, I have been a teacher for, this is my 10th year. Uh, I spent the last seven of that teaching um, high school social studies at Blaine High School, and I currently reside in Ham Lake, Minnesota. Thanks, Justine. Carter, do you want to go next? Sure. So my name is Carter Anderson. Uh, I'm a student at Blaine High School in Minnesota, and then I also reside in Blaine, and I'm currently a junior uh, at Blaine High School. Thanks for joining us, Carter. Meryl, do you want to go next? Hi, uh, I'm Meryl, and I'm a freshman at Blaine High School, and I live in Blaine, Minnesota. Wonderful. Thanks, all of you, for joining us. Now, I think what a lot of people would love to hear is your perspectives of the last year. So looking back, you know, what have been some of the challenges that you've faced, either as an educator or a student, in the current situation that our world is experiencing? And then the second piece I would ask after that is, any advice or suggestions you have for those listening of where they can assist or help educators and students right now to provide what's needed to you to make sure you're getting the most out of your experience and your education? I guess I will start with that. Uh, from a teacher's perspective, there's so many like different directions that I can take this in. Um, my first thought is, of course, going on a tangent about how unhealthy it is to, you know, stare at a screen for eight hours as an adult, let alone as a, you know, eighth or ninth or tenth grader. Um, I could also dive into some of the crazy tech issues we've experienced, like, you know, sound quality um, or the big one, Wi-Fi issues. Obviously, that is like literally the new version of the dog ate my homework. Um, but uh, the biggest issue that uh, from a teacher perspective that I face is just that engagement and connectedness to students. Um, the biggest thing with teaching, I mean, the number one thing as a teacher we should do is build those positive relationships because without them, there's really no foundation for learning. Um, and it is next to impossible or very, very challenging with our current platform and our current state uh, to be able to build that same level of engagement and relationship that I, you know, would normally do uh, in a classroom environment. Um, you know, the biggest thing as a teacher, too, just talking at a wall the entire day. Uh, for the most part, I'm staring at muted screens, muted mics. Um, and, and so it's really, you know, wondering if the students are even listening and, and that sort of thing. Um, and certainly that is not to any fault of the students, Mural and Carter. Um, I've been to plenty of staff meetings in the same format where we're all muted, we're all hiding behind that mic uh, and that uh, muted button, but um, the level of participation is really low. Um, and a lot of that, again, comes from just the platform that we're, that we're teaching on with distance learning um, and just the the fact that a lot of students are also at home where there's a lot of um, distractions, whether it be 
um, you know, younger siblings screaming in the background. So they can't unmute. Or maybe they are running into tech issues or even experiencing homelessness themselves. And so they're sitting in a car in a McDonald's parking lot, which has happened. Um, and, and so it, it's really, really challenging um, in general to just deal with uh, some of those technology uh, gaps and technology issues. Uh, one of the biggest things that I'd love to, to get heard is just that right now uh, it's hard. It's hard for teachers. It's hard for parents. It's hard for students. Um, and approaching, you know, reverting back to something like a hybrid model, while it might be, um, you know, a better option than distance learning, um, there's a lot of added challenges. And we ask just for patience and, and help um, and you know, perhaps more technology training and support, um, as well as creating new and engaging ways and ideas to be able to continue to build those positive relationships with students in a distance learning platform. Now, something important, I think, and parents can maybe relate to this, or even um, some of our politicians, um, they are dealing with people they've never met face to face. I'm sure you're dealing with students right now that you're only meeting over video chat. You're not able to ever meet them in person. So that to your point around building that relationship, you're building it via virtual. You've never had the opportunity with some of these students if they were incoming freshmen or new students to you to meet them in person. Is that correct, Justine? Yes, uh, absolutely. So besides a brief stint in a hybrid mode right at the beginning of the school year, we've been in distance learning this whole year. Um, and so I would say over 75% of my students currently being that I teach mostly ninth grade, um, I've never met. Yeah, that's such a challenge that I don't think everyone realizes that you guys are dealing with and building those fundamental relationships with students as they enter um, their high school years. And then something else you touched on that people may not realize is these students don't all have access to the same Wi-Fi. So for them to have access to even basic internet, to be able to get on their courses, distance and from home, even if the school provides them with a laptop, that internet access is a fundamental need now that they may not have access to where they are sitting in a parking lot or a public space trying to get public Wi-Fi to be able to do this. Yeah. So I think that's important for people to realize, right? That's another challenge you're dealing with as a teacher. Yeah, absolutely. And also just not to be punitive to those students because it's easy for us as teachers to look at that and say, hey, this kid hasn't logged in in five days. Clearly, he's just slacking um, or falling behind. And then actually having to put on like your, you know, humble cap a little bit and realizing like, okay, maybe that's because they are taking care of four siblings and they are also dealing with Wi-Fi issues or added challenges. Um, and that's not even to add in the, you know, the huge mental health component that has become a big issue lately. Yeah, absolutely. So huge challenges just for all of us to think about. Thanks, Justine, for bringing those to light for some of us that may not even be realizing um, the fundamental concerns students are facing today. Now, um, Carter and Meryl, I would love to hear from you as students some of the challenges that you're seeing or facing with basically, you know, Carter, you're a junior. Meryl, you're a freshman. Um, you're just entering your journey, Meryl, in high school. And Carter, you're a couple years in on um, what you're facing and, and what people can do to assist or help being where you sit in your educational journey at this point. Sure, so I guess I can start. Um, what I've really found missing in my educational experience is a massive, massive lack in connection between like student and teacher. Um, I understand that you know distance learning is set up really as effectively as currently allowed, but even then I just noticed a massive difference between this and an in-person uh, component because instead of you know in actual school we're really connected by constant interactions conversations with teachers and other encounters but on the online we're really only connected by like a few clicks and a button press and that's it so this massive gap between the student and the teacher um just causes really a massive decrease in motivation and learning um i mean i can tell you that firsthand that i i feel a lot less motivated to do my assignments uh, because school feels so distant, it, it really is harder to find the motivation because whereas in actual school, you know, you have a teacher telling you to do assignments, they're right in front of you, and you're presently being reminded that, you know, this is a real thing. And online, I mean, it's it's a few pixels on a screen and a voice over a speaker, um, maybe a text on a Google Classroom page. And all of that is way, way harder to really find yourself motivated to complete those assignments. 
And because of that, um, because of this decrease in motivation, I've also noticed just a massive lack in effective learning. Um, because even as much as effort the teachers put into it, because it's so much harder to be motivated and find that motivation, it's so much harder to digest the content that, you know, teachers are teaching you. Um, and, you know, when you're in school, a classroom is an environment that's built to learn. You know, you're surrounded by things that are designed to help you in your educational process. But in distance learning, you know, you're surrounded at your house. You have countless distractions. Um, I mean, I, I can tell you in my room, I mean, I have unfettered access to the Internet, so I can really do whatever I want. Um, and there's nothing to really sort of check me and make sure I'm focusing. I mean, I'll catch myself sometimes wandering without even intending to just because that's how easy it is to get pulled away from class um and all of this you know because you're not learning as effectively and because it's so much harder to feel motivated I've noticed that there's just a massive drop in both classroom performance and because of that um also the mental health of students you know when you have students a lot of my friends that are typically used to performing well in school when they're not performing as well as they are because it's so much harder to be motivated that's really taking a toll on their mental health, both just because they themselves are not as happy, but also, you know, because their parents may be hard on them. So because it's so much harder to be motivated and then learn, uh, you see that massive drop in performance and mental health. And what I really think can be done to alleviate these issues is just somehow having an increased interaction between class and teacher. One of my greatest classes in this current situation is um, really made that way because the teacher really makes an effort to constantly prompt info from the class and really increase class engagement as much as, much as possible. And it's the class that I feel most connected to like the actual in-school environment. So I feel like either just teachers sort of making that effort um, to really sort of go out and connect to students over, uh, over the screen and also um, some sort of platform that maybe prompts students to increase their information. Um, I know that there are presentation softwares that can sort of act in between slides have, you know, a question pop up or something to increase engagement. All of those technologies and behavior that really work to increase and remind students that this is cool, you're here to learn, and this is what you're learning, uh, would go to really just create a significant amount of distance success that we aren't really currently seeing. I love that. So it sounds like one of the big suggestions for administrators um, are politicians, the folks in charge, teachers to hear is engagement's really important. You were used to having time and space where it was dedicated. When you stepped into that school building, that's what you were focused on was school and what was happening in that building for that period of time. But distance, now you've got a lot of other things that can compete for your time, space, and energy. So we got to figure out how to um, create platforms and technologies that engage students again in a way that's meaningful and engage them. It sounds like even to your other students, right, that are that would be in those classes with you. Because mm -hmm. I, I understand the challenge with your teachers, but is the same level of interaction happening for you right now with your peers in terms of talking about what you're working on, you know, like you mentioned, there's a lot of systems in place in a classroom where you get feedback from other students, you hear their ideas, you learn from them. Has that changed for you as well in terms of just learning from other students and being able to bounce ideas off other students on the same types of topic? Yeah, I, I've definitely also found it, it's much harder to relate to students. You know, there's a massive drop in social interaction. Um, like you said, in a classroom setting, I can turn to my classmate right next to me and ask, hey, what is this? How do I do this? Or maybe just discuss ideas. But now the closest I can get is maybe unmuting and then having a bit of a delayed conversation that isn't as natural because you're in front of the entire class. Or if class has already ended, I mean, just a fairly linear text conversation that it's a lot harder to convey ideas over because, I mean, you know, just going back and forth one on one, you lose that free flow of ideas and lose that free flow of information. The closest you can get maybe is a video call, but even then you just lose that actual in-person component of being able to examine what's going on, talk with them in person. And all of that just makes it again, a lot harder to cooperate with peers and work with them to further your other education. Now that's great feedback, Carter. And I appreciate you sharing that. Um, lots of things to think about for a lot of people about how do we engage, interact and make that more possible again for students. So I appreciate you sharing. Um, we'll move over to Meryl. So Meryl, you're a freshman. Why don't you tell us what you're experiencing in that journey? 
So I would have to agree with Ms. Weavers and Carter a lot. So as a freshman, I'm just entering high school and high school is a totally new thing. Like, you know, you're in middle school, you're kind of still playing, figuring out what you want, but now you're in high school. It's real. You have to take it real. Like Carter said, there's so many distractions in your room and you can procrastinate really quick. When you procrastinate, you end up with so much work at the end that you're not going to get as well done as if you did on time. But again, we're teenagers. Our beds are right next to us. Why would I sit and do my lesson rather than just sleep all day, you know? So, um, and another thing is the emotional connection. You can't really connect emotionally over a computer screen. But when you're in person with your teacher, there are emotional connections that happen. And then you are more comfortable with your, you know, peers, with your classmates, and it's much easier to talk and have conversations and ask questions rather than in front of a computer screen. So it gets much harder for teachers and students to interact with each other. And, um, you know, with your peers, you really, I'm a high schooler, i meeting new people. I really don't know much people in my classes. And you, we really haven't had that connection where we can just text or talk or when you are in breakout rooms, we can't really just start talking to each other if we don't know each other. And we've never seen each other faces because our cameras are off. So it makes it really hard to just, you know, meet new people and interact at the same time. No, thanks, Meryl. That makes total sense, right? I mean, that, think about it for folks out there listening to Meryl. I mean, relate to you're in a new job and you've never met your boss in person or you've never met your coworkers. Um, they're having to engage and interact and never have seen these people in real life or in person. So it's a huge disconnect. Meryl, is there any advice or suggestions you would give to folks about how we create more of that? Um, any things you've seen that you think would be helpful? If not, that's okay. But if you have any ideas, we'll take suggestions. You know, I think that in one of my classes, we do a lot of games and activities, and that really motivates us more. Seminars are fun. Competitions are fun because then you want to get it. Like, you know, you want to compete. You want to play. And then that kind of gets your confidence up. I think another thing is that we as students, we can't be shy behind the screen. Like we have to speak up and you know, you're, you shouldn't be scared. You're in front of a screen, nobody's gonna come out and lash at you. So, you know, just be yourself. I think that that's one of the biggest thing that during distance learning, you can't really be yourself because you're in a screen, you know? And I think we need more opportunities to like, you know, be able to speak in class we're mostly listening to our teacher and then going to watch a video and doing an assignment. But I think if instead of watching the video, we spent more time in the Google Meet talking with our teachers and in interacting, that would be way better than just watching a video, doing an assignment. Because like Carter said, there is really a lack of learning. Like we're not learning as much while we're in distance learning, I feel. I love that. So engagement, interaction, contest, things to get you guys to have the opportunity to engage and connect. And I think this is all great feedback for, for teachers who are learning for the first time, as um, Ms. Weavers mentioned, how to distance learn, right? They were used to having students in class and maybe some messages for our teachers out there listening as well of how to engage and connect to your students in a new way and learn the best way they interact digitally. So I thank you again to all three of you for taking the time to be present with us today and a part of International Day of Education. Thank you, Meryl, Carter, and Ms. Weirs for all of your advice and feedback you're giving um, to help all of us get better as we navigate this challenging time in our world. So thank you again to all of you. I appreciate your feedback. Any parting comments I missed, I'll open it up if there's anything I didn't get. But again, just thank you to all three of you for being a part of this. I want to say thank you for the opportunity and uh, for all the people that are my age, get up, do your voice, you know, be you and don't be shy or afraid. I love it. Thanks, you guys. And I'm going to invite Jennifer back now to show us what they have created in partnership with Anoka Hennepin. That's a way that the school district is finding to bring less of a barrier between the physical and the digital. Um, welcome back, uh, Jennifer, and we'll be uh, showing you some examples of what they're doing. 
Jennifer, those interviews with the Anoka Hennepin School District, the biggest one in our state, I also have seen some of the other interviews you've been doing with students, with teachers, with parents, gathering the kind of information that we need to think about where do we go, not just how do we recover, but what do we do? And I've been inspired by seeing them, but the main thing I wanted to have this opportunity to talk with you for a few minutes is I know you've been putting together with the folks from Anoka Hennepin, a technological approach, a solution, a way to begin to address these issues, not just in the schools, but also parents uh, like yourself and others. Can you give our audience just a brief overview of what you and the district are working on right now? Because this is a true breakthrough that many others will be interested in. Absolutely. Thanks, Mark, for having us. Um, first and foremost, um, before being a tech entrepreneur and CEO, I'm a mother and I'm a parent. And I have a five-year-old and a 10-year-old who are living, as you heard from those students, the social and emotional issues around connecting to their teachers, connecting to their classmates. And when myself and our two co-founders started this platform and wanted to build this, we were building it for students. We were building it for teachers. We were building it to support the people in our community that we know need this connection right now. So the platform is really based off of exactly what you said, which is listening to the needs and the challenges that students, administrators, and teachers are facing today. You heard from them that social and emotional connection. You don't get the opportunity anymore to sit in your classroom and collaborate and bounce ideas off of your friends, your teachers, those folks. We want to bring that back into the classroom. We want these students to have a place to hang out with other students and bounce ideas. We see that this isn't ending anytime soon. We've got to create solutions for the future that allow seamless digital and physical connection and collaboration. The other thing you heard is this isn't a 24 by seven operation. Our schools shut down at a certain time of the day and they need the support from our counties, the other services that are available to them. We wanted to build a platform that seamlessly allows for those services mm -hmm. to come in and take over where those schools have to leave off at a certain point in the day. So if you think about it, this is really where our digital and physical worlds can meet seamlessly for all of us safely to connect our students, our teachers, our administrators, our service providers to one another in an environment for their mm -hmm. mental health, all those things. That's what's been so exciting for me is seeing is true public private partnership on a broad scale. You as a mom and a parent, but you and a tech firm, that's one of the biggest, fastest growing, dealing with big data, lots of possibilities, lots of things, but they're real problems that are facing big school districts, urban school districts, little tiny ones. So you've begun developing with Anoka Hennepin and others a very practical approach. You want to just show, show us quickly what that looks yeah. like? Yeah, imagine, yeah, exactly. Imagine that digital school of the future, right? Like you're talking about where seamlessly before next school year, it, you know, immediately schools could start spinning up digital representations of those buildings. So I'll just quickly show it to you. It's easy to navigate is the key, right? We want students to be able to get in and connect to their teachers, their peers, all of those folks. And it's a summarization of those challenges you just heard from students, administrators, teachers that they're dealing with of how do I know a student's online? How do I know if they're available? It may be nine o'clock at night and the teacher isn't there at the moment, but when she gets to her office the next day, her digital office that we're creating, she's able to see if that student visited that digital office. So instead of having to physically be in the building, we're creating that social and emotional connection back to those folks. So it's a platform that really allows to parents even, I've heard as a parent, I want to know before it's too late that my student wasn't doing assignments, right? That they aren't completing things on time. This is a huge stressor and strain on these teachers. Every wall in our school is an integration where those teachers have historical data and information 
to pull up and access real time. Digitally being able to know what type of learner those students are in our environment. So you know that one of those students really is a visual learner. So you have to draw it out for them on the board and they can see it in our school. One of those students, maybe someone who has to watch it two or three times. We create videos and assets where those students can go back when they're available and ready to focus to look at that information. Because I think one of the things that these students brought up that I know I'm facing just as a parent, a mom, and someone in a company and an organization is focus. Our focus sometimes is better than others. And now with digital schools, students may be better in the afternoon than they are in the morning, for example, at completing work. They be, may be better in the evenings. We allow students to learn at the pace and meet them where they are in terms of their education and completing the work they need to complete to further themselves for their journey in education. So Anoka Hinnepin, very big school district for our state, but very, very activated and motivated and visionary leadership. How will you work together with them to bring this online, so to speak, to bring this into reality in a way that begins that physical and digital seamlessness? We've already created a digital uh, mock-up of their school in our digital space. So if you Fabulous. look on a map, if you see it, so I'll pull it up real quick just so you can see the school we created. I just want to flash it up for you guys. This is a digital representation of a map like you guys would see it in um, anywhere where you're looking at mapping software. If we quick click on a school, this is an actual school in one of our districts. We have a place here where students can have lockers, classrooms, and the main floor replicates that physical building. So if we click in, for students, this is like home. This is coming wow. home digitally to their school. So it's it's their school. It is their school. If I'm a kindergartner, no Zoom links, no Google Hangouts, no whatever. I pop into this room and all of a sudden I'm in a room with my teacher. You have the option as soon as you get in to be able to use camera and you'll see Rick in a second. He's real. <laughs> Our cameras and audio work in these rooms. Teachers can immediately connect to their students without struggling for 10 minutes that every student has the link to be able to find my teacher. I can find my teacher seamlessly in this room. Great. And do I get my own locker? You get your own locker. That's the beautiful thing, too. As students, the class of 2034, you'll see here, each one has their own digital space. They can store assignments. They can store projects, things they're really proud of. We all maybe had those memory boxes people kept for us of all our fabulous art. Now we can just automatically digitally store that those, that work and that body of work that they've worked on their whole career in their locker space. So my favorite time was the big auditoriums where we had all of those incredible programs. Is that oh, possible? Absolutely. What you'll see here is there's a homeroom. I could do this by class and grade, or I could actually host an entire event for the entire school in an auditorium. What you also have the capability to do digitally is, let's say you have this amazing speaker that only is in Minnesota, but you want to broadcast that speaker to schools all over the country. We can digitally put those speakers into our auditorium and have that broadcast anywhere that has the ability to get into our digital school. Well, so you'll be putting this together with this big district, but I can see that small districts, rural districts, others have this applies, you know, in the same sort of way. I want to make sure that all of the folks watching today uh, know that they can, you know, check out the archive version of this because we're going to have the expanded. But I also know that we've got to come back to this again soon. These young people, these students, ninth graders, uh, uh, these young, uh, young and high school older had insights and perspectives about how their learning and their lives have been impacted in what they're doing. And I want to make sure that we have a chance to share that. Today's kind of a narrow focus, but now we know that this is one of the really creative ways that you as a parent, you as a mom who has this as a challenge, reached out to the others in the mix of education 
and you have begun to build a new solution that begins to bring the physical and the digital together and meets young learners, students where they are. Thank you so much for sharing this today. And I can't wait till we get together and do a, a kind of expanded version of this again and be able to show a big picture and to follow the progress of Anoka Hennepin and others who are taking us into this new future for learners that they're creating. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mark, for having us.